Hey guys, Metal Jesus here, and I am back again with Kinsey. And today we're going to talk about some tips and tricks for traveling in Japan, because it can be a little bit overwhelming and scary, but this is some stuff we learned along the way. So the first thing is, how are you going to get there? You need airline tickets. And what we did, and I must say, we got a heck of a deal. And it was just being in the right place at the right time and being very flexible with our dates. Our dates had to be exact to get that deal that we got. We had to leave on that Sunday and we had to come back on that Thursday. But there's definitely deals to be had. For international flights, you can book well ahead of time. And that's how we got this deal in particular. But there's also a lot of apps out there like Hopper. And even Google Flights will let you track flights now so you can watch prices rise and fall and buy when either the app or Google suggests it. A lot of people ask if a JR Pass is worth it. And the answer is probably. So what I like to think is that if you add up your Shinkansen tickets and you can get the prices for all these trips on Google Maps, but if you add up your Shinkansen tickets and it costs more than the what you're paying for the pass, then it's definitely worth it. And this was in our case because we took the Shinkansen twice from Tokyo to Osaka and back. And there is a few train lines within Tokyo itself that this will help you out with. And to be clear, it's called the JR Pass because in Japan, a lot of train lines are privately owned. And this one only happens to work with the JR lines. For example, in Tokyo, you have the Yamanote line, which goes in a circle to all the really awesome tourist spots you can go to. And the next thing is, where are you going to stay? Well, you're in luck because Japan has so many options. You can stay in just regular business hotels. One note about Airbnbs is that they will probably ask you for your passport ahead of time. So just a heads up. And for a cheaper option, especially for solo travelers, there's a lot of hostels and capsule hotels, which I'm sure you've heard all about. I've traveled a lot in the past and not owned a portable power brick, but for Japan, I broke down and bought one and I'm very glad I did. This particular one that I bought has a 26,800 milliamp hour charge, which is amazing because basically you could charge your iPhone like seven or eight times. It just provided power every time we needed it. We didn't have to go looking for a Starbucks or looking for a place to plug in. No, we always had power. It was really nice. In our case, the trip from Seattle to Japan was about 10 hours long. And so some of the things to keep in mind, depending on the, uh, the airline that you're gonna fly on, is whether or not they'll have in-flight entertainment. Now, many of them will, but I still like to load up my iPad or my iPhone with movies. And people forget that actually YouTube Premium allows you to download and store offline all your subscriptions. And so you can go through and actually download as many as you want. Same thing with Netflix. It's just nice to have in case you need it. Another thing I would recommend you do before you leave is go ahead and install Google Maps and also Google Translate. Now those are two separate applications. The thing to know about Google Translate is that there are language packs that you're gonna have to download after you put the app on your phone. Not a big deal, but sometimes it can be fairly large. And just having those downloaded and ready to go the moment that you're off the airplane is perfect. All right, so you've landed in Japan and you are walking around the airport. Now, one of the first things that I recommend you do is rent either a pocket Wi-Fi device, that's what I did, or get a SIM card that will work in that country. Now, you can reserve these ahead of time, which actually I recommend you do if you go to Japan during the busy season or maybe during the Olympics. For me, I actually got lucky when I got off the plane, I was able to find and rent a pocket Wi-Fi fairly quickly. But here's the thing, is that once you have this and it's activated, you just throw it in your backpack and then all of your devices, up to 10 of them, always has internet. It's super convenient and when you pair it with that power brick, you're good to go. 
And one of the first things you want to do when you land is you want to get yourself a Suica or Pasmo card if you land around Tokyo or an Aikoa card if you land down in Kansai, which is Osaka and Kyoto area. And what that is, it's basically a card you can load money on and use it to on the trains, on the buses. And what's cool about it is you can also use it at a lot of convenience stores and vending machines and most arcades take it as well. So I actually use it on a lot of crane games, maybe too many. And a lot of people have asked where to convert your money. And the answer is maybe don't do it at the airport. Those aren't always the best exchange rates. What we found is just using an ATM at a 7-Eleven, Family Mart, or Lawson was actually the best way to go. And it's super convenient since they're everywhere. Now I mentioned putting Google Maps on your smartphone and once you land in Japan, you are gonna be blown away by just how well it works there. Google Maps will tell you what train line to take, where to get on and off for your destination and also how much it costs. And because it's tied to your phone, it's doing it all in real time, which is again, super convenient. It's like walking around with your own personal travel guide. And one thing to note is that there's not a lot of trash cans in Japan, at least public ones. And this is mainly because walking and drinking or walking and eating is generally frowned upon. So you'll find trash cans around food stalls or around vending machines, but not really anywhere else. So this is something you definitely need to prepare for. One thing to note is that used games there are beautiful. They're usually in great shape and the person selling it to you will usually open up the box or case and show you the back of the disc, show you the manual, just to show you the condition of everything and if you're okay with it. And one thing that I noticed is especially at stores like Mandarake, a lot of prices differ a lot. They're quote unquote A rating, so like maybe like a mint condition versus their C rating can vary a lot in price. And so that's a way that you can save a lot of money while buying used games there because you know what? I was just fine with that C rating. And speaking of buying games, it's important to know that most of the current generation of consoles are completely region free, meaning that you can go to Japan, buy your games, bring them home and play them just fine on your Xbox One, your Switch or your PlayStation 4. However, previous generations of consoles may or may not have region locking. And so that's very important to know when you go there and you're looking at 40 years worth of video games. So if you're like me and you wanna play a bunch of shooters on the Xbox 360, well, it may be worth your while to also pick up a Japanese version of the Xbox 360 console and bring it home with you. So a lot of people ask me, how did I get all these games home? And the truth is actually, I travel pretty light. I don't plan on carrying most of this home with me. Instead what I do, at about two thirds of the way through the trip, I go to the local Japanese post office box, I buy a cardboard box, stuff it full of as much stuff as I can, and I mail it back to myself in Seattle. So another option, is depending on what airline that you're on, we flew Delta, which allows for international flights to checked bags. Stores like Don Quixote that sell a little bit discounted merchandise and they're found all over Japan, they sell like luggage starting at about 50 or $60. So it might be a cheaper option actually to buy another suitcase and then check it. Even if your airline doesn't offer this many checked bags, Sometimes the first check bag is only about $30, which is still cheaper than mailing it back. Now, one thing to keep in mind though, is that Japan is very strict in shipping anything back with the rechargeable battery. So all your handhelds like the PSP and the Vita, the DS, you can't send those to the mail. You're gonna have to put that in your luggage. I think one of the most important tips is to remember that you can't do everything all in one trip. Plan on going back because if you go to Japan, you're gonna wanna. Also, try to give yourself a little bit of extra time on certain days, because then you can explore off the beaten path. There's so many small alleyways known as yokuchos, which you might find small bars, shops, shrines, and more. So it's definitely worth giving yourself a little bit of time to explore. So that's our quick tips and tricks for going to Japan. I hope you guys found this useful. And if you have specific questions, go ahead and post them down in the comments below. We would be happy to help you out. I know many of you are considering going to Japan and that's why we wanted to make this video. And uh, I know you're gonna have a great, great time. All right, guys, thanks very much for watching. Thank you for subscribing and take care.